We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. And happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room. We're in the middle of a series right now called Unshakables. And the idea behind the series is we are looking at the essentials of our faith, the hills that we are willing to die on, the things that, you know, if other people think differently about these subjects, they're just too big of a disagreement for us to be able to, to really consider ourselves part of the same fellowship. So as followers of Christ, these are the things that we, when we open up this book, we call our unshakables. Last week, we talked about God. What does the Bible say about God? There was a, a story of, of two brothers. Uh, they were really not behaving properly. They had a single mother who was just at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do. So she said, listen, I'm going to take you across the street to the church, and I'm going to make the pastor there talk to you and see if he can get to the bottom of this. So the first older son, she grabs him and says, come across the street. And she, she goes into the pastor's office and sets him down and, and goes and shuts the door. And the pastor looks at this young boy. And says, son, where is God? And the boy doesn't say anything. In fact, he slouches down in his chair and kind of starts curling up in a ball. And he looks at him again. He says, son, where is God? And the boy gets up. He immediately starts crying. He runs out of the room, across the street, into his house, into his bedroom, into his closet, and curls up into a little ball, crying. And the younger son is freaking out now because he knows he's got to go next. So he goes into his brother's closet and he says, what in the world happened over there at the church? And he says, I don't know, but God's missing and they think we did it. <laughs> and so if you were here last week, you know that God isn't missing. God is all over. God's omnipresent. And today we're going to look not at at the, the triune God, we're going to look at one of the persons of God. We're going to zoom in and look at the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now for some of you, by the way, uh, you hear Jesus Christ often enough that you have come to a point where you think that Jesus is his first name and Christ is his last name, right? I want you to know that's not true. Christ is actually a title. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it really means anointed one. And so we recognize when we call Jesus, Jesus Christ, that there's something special about Jesus. There's something uh, set apart about him that he was the promised one. And so when we, when we use that phraseology, that's what we mean by that. Another thing that's important to know is Jesus, the person of Jesus, actually lived a little over 2,000 years ago. You can ask historians of faith. You can ask historians who aren't people of faith. And they will all agree that there was a real person named Jesus who claimed to be the Son of God. And, and that Jesus is the one that, that we, we sing to, we, we pray to, and we worship. We believe he was who he claimed to be. And so in this message today, I want to explore who is Jesus. In fact, if someone were to come up to you tomorrow, they walk up to you at work or they walk up to you at the grocery store and they ask you a simple question. They said, who is Jesus? is Jesus. What would you say? Have you thought about that? Would you have uh, an answer ready? I, I know most of us would say, oh, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Or you would say, you'd maybe talk about how Jesus has changed your life. Maybe you'd, you'd talk about how Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for theirs. And, and you'd probably have something ready to go if you're a person of faith in this room, right? Well, I want to explore what the Bible says about how we should answer that question. Who is Jesus, according to Scripture? So again, if you go to our church's website and you go to our What We Believe page, we've taken this essential of faith right off of there. We're going to put it right up here on the screen. And let's go ahead and read this together. All right? If you're a follower of Christ, you'll be able to say this with, with you know, boldness. Uh, you'll be able to say this with enthusiasm. If you're in this room and you're not quite sure about Jesus... 
Uh, you can still say this out loud, and we'll just explore these things together, right? Let's read this out loud together. Here's what it says. We believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the one and only Savior. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, both fully human and fully God. Jesus lived a sinless life, died on the cross to atone for our sins, was raised from the dead on the third day, and is coming again. Who's with me on that? All right. All right, so, so we know in, in a simple couple of sentences, this is who Jesus is, but I want to zoom in on a few of these words and explore why we believe that. What does the Bible say about these things? Why do we believe that Jesus is, is described properly in this statement? The Bible has a lot to say about Jesus, so we only have, you know, about 34 minutes to explore some of these things. It's very much a survey of who Jesus is, but I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this with you. Here's number one. If you're taking notes this morning, number one, I want you to know that Jesus is Savior. The Bible is really clear about this. In fact, you can even put in parentheses next to the word Savior, uh, He is the one and only Savior. There is no other option for Savior. Here's how Scripture puts it in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 11. It says, For Jesus is the one referred to in the Scriptures, where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Now listen to this part. This part's the most important. Number, uh, verse 12, There is salvation in no one else. Will you say that sentence with me? There is salvation in in no one else. It goes on to say, God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. You know what's interesting about this verse is there's an implication that comes out of this verse. Uh, Essentially, it's this, that you and I, in order for there to be a Savior, it means that you and I need to be saved. That there's a problem, there's a, a pit there's a, a brokenness, there's an illness, there's something that we're being saved from. And I don't know why we don't say this phrase very often anymore. I remember when I was much younger, I'd hear people say, well, I got saved. I got saved when I was whatever. And, I, and they would use this phrase, I got saved. And for some reason, maybe because it's too churchy or whatever, we don't use this phrase as often as we used to. But at the end of the day, it's such a wonderful phrase because it perfectly explains the work of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I was broken and lost, and I got saved by Jesus. I was sick, and I got saved by Jesus. I was on a road that led to eternal separation from God in a real place called hell, and I got saved out of that by Jesus. I don't know about you, but I I love the phrase, I've been saved. I got saved by Jesus. He is my Savior. You know, what's interesting is if you were to go to a a pool, you know, it's summertime, all your pools are open now. If you've got a community pool or one in your backyard or find a puddle after it rains somewhere, and uh, wherever wherever you, you do your swimming, if you're out there and you're enjoying yourself and you're not having any issues, you're probably not looking up at the lifeguard. You're probably not waving your hands around right? When do we do that? If you get like a, maybe a a, a spasm in your leg, or you start feeling like you're having a medical emergency, or for some reason you can't tread water all of a sudden, you're probably going to start yelling and flailing your arms all over the place, because in that moment, you know you need a lifeguard to get off of their thing and come in and save you. You're going to be looking for help, and the truth is, the more that we recognize that we are lost The more that we recognize that we are drowning, the more that we recognize that we are on, uh, that all of us, because of our sin nature, our default mode is that we are headed to an eternal separation from God in a real place called hell. When you recognize that, your default response is to say, save me. I need saving. See, a lot of people, you don't, outside of Christ, you're not in a relationship with Jesus because you haven't yet come to a realization that you need saving. I, my heart says that you probably actually know it. You know there's a problem. You, you recognize your brokenness. 
But so far, you're trying to figure this thing out on your own. The truth is that Jesus is the one and only Savior. It says in John 14, 6, Jesus was talking to Thomas, answering a question. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Now, let me explore a hard truth here. When I say that Jesus is a Savior, what would be really wrong is if any of you walked out of here today saying, well, I guess we're all good. Jesus is a Savior. The pastor said it. We all get to walk out of here saved. Jesus is a Savior. But that doesn't mean that every single one of you in this room has been saved by the Savior. That's a a personal decision that you have to make to step into this relationship where the lifeguard comes in and, and pulls you out of the mess that you're in. You see, Jesus is not a Savior for everybody, though His love and His saving grace is open to anybody who would receive it. Jesus wants to save every single person in this room. If you are outside of a relationship with Jesus, Jesus is longing for you to be in a relationship with Him, but He lets you decide whether or not you want to step into that relationship. Let me show you a little bit uh, how Scripture shows us we, we, we walk into that relationship where we say, Jesus, I'm flailing my arms here. I need to be saved. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we see in Scripture that Jesus' love for all the world. He sent his son to die for every single person, but only through placing your faith in Jesus will his death on the cross save you. Number two, what we learn about Jesus is that he was born of a virgin. We see this in Scripture. We put this in our essentials of, of faith on our website because we think this is an important thing to declare about Jesus, that he, that in this uh, virgin birth, you have this person named Mary. We, we believe that it, the Bible teaches that, that Jesus is the son, the human son of a human named Mary. Let's talk about Mary. But first, let me tell you a story about a boy. There's a boy, and around Christmas time, he wanted to write a letter, uh, uh, and instead of writing a letter to Santa, he's going to write a letter to Jesus, all right? So he He gets out a pen and paper and he writes, Dear Jesus, here are the things I would like for Christmas. I have been a good boy all year long. And he thinks about it. He recognizes that's not true at all. He's talking to Jesus, right, after all. So he crumbles up the piece of paper and he throws it away and he says, Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy all month long. And he thinks about it. No, 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 no. I can't lie to Jesus. So he crumbles that up and throws it away. Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy all week. Crumbles that up. I've been a good boy all day. Crumbles that up. I've been a good boy for the last hour. And he's thinking about, look, this is pathetic. He crumbles that up. He goes over to the manger scene. He grabs Mary out and he puts her in a shoebox up in his closet. And he goes back to his desk and he starts writing, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, (laughs) <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a good boy, right? Probably one of those two sons from the other joke. So we know that Jesus is the, in, the, the human son of a human named Mary. Uh, but Scripture says that this, this birth, there was something miraculous about it, and that Mary was a virgin. That, that, let me show it to you in Scripture, okay? It says in Matthew 1, verse 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, and while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Scripture talks about this where the supernatural meets the natural world, and there's this this otherworldly pregnancy that happens in Mary, that she conceives a child while still, according to Scripture, a a virgin, which doesn't make sense in the natural world. There's something otherworldly about this pregnancy. Why is it important that Jesus was born of a virgin, that that this conception was of the Holy Spirit, not of Joseph? A couple things that come to mind. Number one, if Jesus were, uh, had had a human 
uh, genealogy on this side and human genealogy on this side, what would have been born was a human being, a fully human, no God uh, likeness, no godness at all, and just fully susceptible to sin nature, not just susceptible to sin nature, but born into the sin that all of us were born into. And, and if that were the case, Jesus wouldn't have been able to, to cover for you on the cross. He would have been a human born into sin just like you. So that wouldn't have worked. And here's the cool thing. Because Jesus was born of a virgin through the conception of the Holy Spirit, what Jesus is in this moment now is 100% man through, through Mary's side and 100% God through the side of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is technically a, a man just like you and I, capable of, 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 of sin, able to be tempted into sin, but because he is 100% God and God cannot sin, it's impossible for Jesus to sin. And so Jesus is able to come in as fully human and fully man and live a life in perfection the way none of us could ever figure out how to do. That's super important to understand. Another thing that's really cool about uh, why, why Jesus being born of a virgin is, is valuable to us is there's actually a, a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament that one day a Savior would come, a Messiah would come, and that he would be born of a virgin. Let me show you one of these prophecies. Isaiah chapter 7, in verse 14, says, All right, then the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, here, here's the sign. The virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. You know, there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament about a coming Savior, about a Messiah who will come. There's prophecy that Jesus will come from a town of Bethlehem. There's, there's prophecy that he'll be born of a virgin. There's other prophecies about Jesus that people should have been, if they studied the Old Testament, their eyes would be open and they'd be looking for someone to come who fulfills these signs and in the fulfillment of those signs knowing this is the promised king, this is the Messiah. Do you know the likelihood of one person just being born that they just happened to be born in Bethlehem and they happened to, to have a mother who claimed to be a virgin and they happened to have all these other things that all kind of came, at just eight of the prophecies in the Old Testament being fulfilled by one person. The likelihood is staggering that one person would fulfill all of those Old Testament prophecies. In fact, it's similar to if you took silver dollars and you had so many of them, you were able to cover the state of Texas in silver dollars two feet deep. So imagine Texas covered up about this high in silver dollars. And you sent one person out there to find any silver dollar that they wanted. All throughout Texas, they could dig down that two feet anywhere they wanted, grab one silver dollar out, and put a big black Sharpie X right across the front of it. And then they could go hide it anywhere in the state of Texas they wanted amongst all the other silver dollars. And then you pick another person, you put a blindfold on them, and you tell them, listen, I want you to go out, walk anywhere you want in the state of Texas, keep walking until you, you want to stop, and then reach down and grab a silver dollar. The odds is that that person would reach out and reach down and find the exact same silver dollar. That's the odds of one person fulfilling just eight of the prophecies described about Jesus in the Old Testament. And Jesus checked all those boxes. And so there's something about recognizing this prophecy that Jesus would come from a virgin. That, that's just one of, one of the eight. And there's even more than eight prophecies made about Jesus. The numbers just get staggering. The truth is that we can see so many reasons to trust God's word. And, and the, the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin is, is one of those. Let me, let me give you number three. Number three, we believe that Jesus is sinless. If you're, uh, you, you probably, everyone in this room knows what sin means. But let me give you a, a kind of a, a good visual picture. The actual word sin, it's an archery term. It comes out of the archery world. And it's a word that means missing the mark. So when an archer pulls back uh, an arrow from a bow and shoots it, and the, bow, the arrow doesn't go where it's supposed to go, in archery world, they would call that a sin. It didn't hit the target. It didn't go where it was supposed to go. One of the best or worst examples of this archery sin ever happening was in the Athens Olympics. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Matt Emmons. 
Matt Emmons was on the U.S. archery team. He had gone through enough rounds that he was in first place and was about to win the gold medal in archery. All he had to do in his final shot was hit the target in any spot. He didn't need to get the center bullseye. He didn't need to get the next ring out. If he hit it anywhere, and and for an, an Olympian archer, this is a very simple task. Everyone's just excited to watch and celebrate as he gets this shoe-in gold medal. There he is. He lines up the shot. All everyone is watching, ready to celebrate with him. He just hits the target. He got enough points already, wins this thing, pulls back. The camera zoomed in on the target, and you hear a thump, and you hear a thump, and the camera doesn't show any arrow at all. He didn't hit the target. They zoom over, and he's got a bullseye on the next guy's target. He was aiming at the wrong target. Missed out on a gold medal. (laughs) He had enough points, he still got a silver medal somehow for hitting the other guy's target. Can you imagine, like, what what an incredible example of sin that is? I mean, he went out there to to do his best. He was given it, he was a pretty good guy, really great at archery. He had a plan to to go out there and actually excel and succeed and and, and actually for people to see how great he was. And in that moment, he missed the target. Uh, he, He didn't even hit the right target. And the the truth is that all of us in this room, we are capable in our human nature of sin. And not only are we capable of sin, we all do it. We all break God's purposes. We, We go outside of God's purpose and plan for our lives. We do things that are not good for us. We're constantly choosing, if you will, like like picture back in the garden. We're constantly picturing to go eat from the tree we're not supposed to. We constantly think, you know what, I'd rather do things my way than God's way. And we call that sin. Here's the problem with sin, is that sin separates us from God. The Bible says that God, the triune God, that He is perfect, He is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. God cannot allow sin and brokenness into His eternal presence. He's not going to do it. And so that causes a problem, because you and I, we have sin, and yet God loves us and wants to be in relationship with us. So He has a plan to send His sinless Son. It's very important that Jesus is sinless. If your belief system believes in Jesus, but you believe that he made some mistakes, he said some things he shouldn't have, he owes some people an apologies, he, 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 he didn't th- think this or do this the right way. If, if any part of your theology has Jesus messing up, I promise you, if you read this book, you'll find that your theology is wrong. Jesus is And always has been perfect and sinless. You know, back in the Old Testament, there was a necessity that when when people made a mistake, they had to atone for their their mistake with with a blood sacrifice. Like we see in 1 Peter 1, 18. It says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value, It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, there it is, spotless Lamb of God. The only reason that that Jesus is able to atone for you is because he was sinless. He was the spotless Lamb of God. In fact, speaking of that, that leads us to our fourth point. Because Jesus was sinless, he was able to be atoning. His death on the cross was able to pay the price for your sin and my sin. He was able to cover it. He was able to forgive your sin and wipe it off of the slate so that one day you will be able to stand before God the Father and be seen as perfect like Jesus was. Let me show you a few passages of Scripture that that highlight this progression. In Leviticus chapter 17, this is the Old Testament, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. In other words, in order for you to receive forgiveness for your sin, it's going to require a blood offering to atone for it. Now what I love, if we fast forward all the way to the New Testament over to Hebrews chapter 9, 
we actually see these, this, this Old Testament understanding of, of a blood sacrifice connected to Jesus. Let's start in verse 6 of chapter 9. It says, When these things were all in place, the priests regularly entered the room, the first room, as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he, and he always offered blood for his own sins, but also the sins of the people the people had committed in ignorance. If you look over at verse 10, it says, For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies. See, none of those blood sacrifices were, were going to really ultimately atone for your sin. None of those blood sacrifices were going to make you right in the eyes of God. That was the old system, and it says it needed uh, to, uh, until a better system could be established. Here's the better system. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. And with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Scripture says that because Jesus was a spotless, sinless lamb, ultimately the Son of God, that God was able to send him to this earth and that through his blood, through his blood, not the blood of an animal that you have to do over and over again and uh, on a regular basis or that annual one that's talking about here. Uh, no, through Jesus' blood, you are offered a once and for all sacrifice that covers everything forever. Jesus is able to atone for your sin. But here's the deal. I don't know if you've ever been at this awkward moment where you're out at a restaurant and you have friends with you they're not part of your family and there's always that moment where the waiter or waitress comes to the table and they say is this going to be on one check or two you know in that moment you're you probably haven't already had this conversation you just decided you're going out with a, another couple you're on a double date and you haven't really thought about who's getting the check and so in that moment everybody kind of just looks at each other and usually the default answer is we'll take separate checks you know the feeling though when when the party you're with says, you know what, we'll just take one check. Now, some of you like to fight people on that, don't you? They're like, hey, just one check. You're like, oh, no, no, no. Well, you know you're lying, right? You know you have no intention of stopping them from doing what they're about to do. You're fine with it. And you're like, you grab your wallet to make it look like you want it. Oh, are you sure? Are you sure? Okay, all right. You're really thankful that you have a friend in that moment that wants to cover your bill. Now think about how this relates to what Jesus, Jesus' atonement is similar to this situation. Jesus is sitting at a table, and he's got all the credit in the world. He owns everything. He's the only one who can ultimately cover the bill. And, and, and in that moment where you, it's, it's time, one moment you are going to be dead, and you're going to be standing before God, and God's going to essentially say, all right, uh, what's on your bill? And for many of us in this room, we've made a decision that when Jesus said, listen, I want to pay for your bill. If you would let me, if you let me cover it, I'm going to cover and pay for all the things that you've racked up on your bill. And one day when you stand before God, he's going to say, oh, it looks like you don't owe anything. You're good to go. Come on in, good and faithful servant. But for a lot of us, for whatever reason, Jesus has offered to pay your bill. He's offered to atone for your sin by his perfect life and death on the cross. And we look at him and we're like, ah, no, nah, no, nah, I got this. I want to pay for my own way. I don't want to go your way. Listen, that's a terrible decision to make. An eternally life-altering decision. You will, you will have to pay for your sin on your own in a real place called hell forever. You know what's crazy, though? A lot of us, by the way, we say, yes, I'll, Jesus, I, I accept your offer of kindness. I would love to accept this gift. I will let you pay for the bill. And then imagine if you're out with a friend and a friend offered to pay the bill. And in that moment, you said, oh, <laughs> excuse me, waiter, um, <laughs> I didn't realize that my friend here was paying the bill. Could you go ahead and grab me uh, the appetizer menu again? I'll take the dessert menu. I, I have a few other things I like to order. 
uh, now that I realize that I'm not paying for any of this. Would you ever go out with that friend ever again? You'd probably change the definition, right? This person would no longer be a friend. This person would be someone who clearly is just in this relationship to use you. And you know, so many of us treat Jesus this way. Yes, Jesus' death on the cross has atoned for your sin. Your bill is being, has been wiped clean, and anything you do from here on out that's not in line with what God wants, that sin that we commit, that's been covered also. But for some of us, we treat Jesus like that friend who's just like, well, since the bill's covered, we might as well just start piling stuff on there. Let him cover this. Let him die for this. Let his blood cover this. What a terrible way to treat someone who's covering your bill. And I get it. Listen, none of us are perfect. It's not like you give your life to Jesus and then the bill just stays clean the rest of your life. Like, I understand. We're constantly putting stuff on this bill, but boy, should we be intentional about saying, Jesus atoned for my sin out of love and kindness for this friendship that we now have, this this familial relationship we have. I'm going to do whatever I can to avoid putting stuff on this tab because he loves me that much. So I want you to understand that Jesus, part of his, his sinlessness, allows him to be able to pay your bill through his blood on the cross. It says in 1 Peter 1.20, by the way, that God chose Jesus. That God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. You know, I want to understand a little bit about what this means. You remember God is everywhere and he's every when. He's outside of time. So when he created the earth and he put it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, he already knew because he's outside of time that Adam and Eve would go up to the thing and eat from it. He already knew that we would break things, that we would choose to do things our own way. He already knows that you're a sinner in need of a savior. And it says before he even created the world, he already knew that we were going to need Jesus. He already had a plan. God the Father had a plan to send his son to die on the cross to atone for your sin, for the sin of anyone who would receive his gift. Y'all, please don't choose to pay your own way. Jesus wants to do that for you. Here's number five. Number five, we know that Jesus is alive. Buddha Joseph Smith, Muhammad, I could go on. All these bodies are dead and in a grave somewhere. At this point, they're a pile of bones. But the Jesus that we sing to, that we worship here at this church, it's a non-essential for us that we recognize Jesus is not still dead. Did he die on the cross? Yes, he did. Did he conquer death three days later? Yes, he did. Jesus is alive. Let me show you why this is important. Again, 1 Peter chapter 1. It says in verse 3, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Why do you have access, church, to be made alive again? Why do you believe one day that after death, God will save you from death and give you eternal life with him. It's because, it says right here, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. See, Jesus conquered death and in doing so secured the hope that you have in one day the same happening for you. Here's number six. We believe that Jesus is returning. This is important. It says in John 14, verse 3, when everything is ready, this is what Jesus says, when everything is ready, I will come and I will get you so that you will always be with me wherever I am. Who wants to be with Jesus? Jesus says when everything's ready, at some point in the future, I'm going to return, and I'm going to come get you. I'm going to bring you to come be with me. 
When is this going to happen, church? It says in Matthew 24, it tells us when. All right, here it says. However, no one knows <laughs> the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. By This is one of the verses that really makes you, your brain shake a little bit when you think of the Trinity, that God and the Father, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all one, and yet somehow you read a verse like this, that the angels, uh, not even the Son himself, only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. The Bible says that at one point, that only God the Father knows, Jesus is going to come back, and it's going to be, it's going to be a bit of a shock. There's going to be some signs. Scripture gives us some things, just like in Noah's day. Noah went out there and told people to repent. He told people what was going to happen. People are going to have a little bit of a heads up, but the actual moment in time that it's going to happen, the moment the rains are going to come down and the flood's going to go up, uh, just like it happened with Noah, the moment that Jesus comes back, nobody knows that day or time. But we do know with confidence, it's an unshakable for us, that Jesus is going to return. That's unshakable. And so we look at these words, that Jesus is the one and only Savior, that He's born of a virgin, in other words, He's fully God and fully man, that He was sinless, and in being sinless, He was able to be that once and forever atonement for us on the cross, that Jesus conquered death so that one day those who have placed their faith in Him as Savior, we can conquer death as well, and one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to return. That's what Scripture says about Jesus. Next time someone says to you, hey, who's Jesus? I hope some of these words come to your mind when you answer that question. And here's what I want to do today for our what now God moment. As you're asking the Holy Spirit, as you're praying right now from wherever you're sitting, God, what do you want me to do with this? If you already have a relationship with Jesus, what I'm going to ask you to do right now is, right now in this moment, I want you to go into a spirit of prayer. I just want you to be praying right where you are for anyone in this room that doesn't know Jesus the way you do. That God right now in this moment would be softening their heart and that that person, those, those people, however many there might be in this room, that there would be something so big and su such a big stirring in their heart that they would not be able to walk out of here today the same way they walked in. And now for those of you who have not yet entered into a relationship with Jesus, you got a whole room of people praying for you right now. And I want to encourage you. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And I want to give you an opportunity today to, to step forward, to come here to the altar, the front of the stage, and say, you know what? I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I don't even know what that means. I don't quite know who Jesus is, but I believe all the things you said. I'm going to take a step of faith and trust that Jesus is who Jesus says. And I want to begin that relationship today. If that's you, I'm going to pray and then at the end of my prayer, I want to invite you to just stand up where you are, wherever you are and come here and, and just chat with me for just a moment. Let's pray. God, would you do a stirring in the hearts of anyone in this room right now that needs it? For those in this room that aren't in a relationship with you, we know that you love them so much you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for them. You've offered to pay their bill. And God, I pray right now that they would accept that offer to allow you to cover for their sin, for you to pay that bill for them so they can begin this new walk with you, this relationship with you, that they can be seen righteous in your eyes. God, would you not let any a pressure from the evil demonic forces of this world keep them in their seats, but would you give them the boldness to stand up at the end of this prayer and come forward and to start a relationship with you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, if you're in this room right now and you need to start a relationship with Jesus, a lot of churches will let you just kind of like do it quietly by raising a hand. And, and we're, we're all about bold proclamation of faith around here. And so if you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, I want to invite you just to come right now. Don't wait anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a countdown. Just wherever you are, just come stand up here for me. I just want to chat with you and lead you in a prayer of faith. I want to encourage that you don't walk out of this place today the same way you walked in. That you're still saying, you know what, I want to pay my own bill. 
Let Jesus cover this bill for you, wherever you are. The last service, we had three people step into a new relationship with Jesus. It was incredibly exciting to watch. If you're in this room, it's not too late. Where are you at? Anyone else want to join Sean up here? All right. Sean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you in a, a, you know, the Bible says in, in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you will be saved. And then we have some initial steps of obedience too that will, someone will be able to chat with you and kind of show you what to do next. All right, but I want to lead you in this prayer, all right? So I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life that I could not live so that he could die in my place for the forgiveness of my sins. And then he rose again so that one day I can too. And I have taken Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Step out of your All right, church, we're going we're gonna to pray together and close out the service. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity that you've given us to walk into a relationship with you through giving us your son, Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us this morning to open up your word and explore the person of Jesus in just a very much of an overview sort of format. But we thank you so much that we can see very clearly that Jesus is our Savior that Jesus is without a doubt, he, he came to this earth, a born of a virgin, so he could be fully man and fully human at the same time, or fully man and fully God at the same time. We're thankful for the truth that he did this life with, without sin, so he could cover for us our sin on the cross. We're thankful, Jesus, that one day we know that we can be alive because you conquered death, and that one day you're coming again for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.